Welcome to Founder Stories. I'm Mike Abbott, and today with me I have Pooja Sankar from Piazza. Welcome. Thank you. So as we get going here, why don't you tell me a little bit about Piazza? Sure. Piazza, in the shortest way to describe it, is an online question and answer platform for students and instructors to learn together. It stems from the problem I had in my undergrad. I went to IIT, which is the top engineering school in India. And before IIT, I had studied in an all-girls high school and, uh, and, and uh, was raised in a very traditional part of India where girls were not allowed to speak to boys and boys were just not allowed to speak to girls. And so when I went to college, there were only boys and three girls in my computer science class. So uh, I didn't know how to talk to them and work with them and study with them. I was too shy. So I felt isolated. And I would try to do assignments by myself, feeling very frustrated and lonely. And that feeling stuck with me. So you know, I got through IIT, uh, went to Maryland College Park for my master's in CS, came to California to be a software engineer at Oracle, then Cosmics, then Facebook, uh, left Facebook to go to Stanford uh, Business School. And in an entrepreneurship class, these entrepreneurs would come and share their stories. And they would always look at us and say, if you think about a problem that you're really passionate about, it's very possible to go out and try to solve it. And that inspired me to say, you know, as a student, I was lonely and I was stuck. And is there a way I can help students get unstuck? Hmm. So I started to speak to many undergrad students at Stanford, many of them boys, and I found out that over the years, with laptops and internet in the dorm rooms, many students now study by themselves. And when they are stuck, they just have a few people to go meet, people around them but they are not able to tap into the potential and the knowledge and expertise of their entire classmate. And so that inspired me to say, well, what can I do online to bring everyone together? So today, we have well over 75% of Stanford, MIT, Cornell, Princeton, Harvard undergrads using Piazza for their classes online over two hours a night. And that is their way that they connect with the rest of their class, their TAs, their professors, and learn together. So it's, it's really exciting. And a great story. So tell us a little bit about that. So you, you get this inspiration. You see this problem. Tell us about those kind of early days as you, as you were at Stanford and you decided you wanted to go build a product yeah. for, for this, this challenge, this problem. It didn't happen overnight. So January 3rd week maybe was the first time that I got really inspired hearing a founder story. and. That night I would be excited, and the next night, and the night after, and then I'd start speaking with many of my classmates about my idea and my passion. And not everyone was passionate the same way I was, but deep inside I just knew it was a problem. And you know, week after week I kept trying to talk to many people about my idea, and it helped me be able to, to explain it well. But it also helped me believe in it deeper and deeper. And really, it, it was June, right after my first year of business school, that I moved in with my brother, set up a table in his garage, and picked up a book on Ruby on Rails, because by background, I was you know, kind of deep server-side coding. Mm -hmm. And so all I knew was C, C++. And so I picked up a book on Ruby, learned HTML, CSS, and built a prototype in 10 days. Called up some professors, gave a demo, and the professors looked at me and said, yeah, you know, I can see something in this that's <laughs> unique. It was very bare bones. But there's some core elements in that first prototype that I deeply believe should exist in any online kind of communication platform among students and teachers. <laughs> and professors appreciated that. And that fall, I launched my first class. So really, if you think about it, January is when I got inspired. You know, April was when I started putting together wireframes. So it was months of meeting people. Mm -hmm. And you know, June, July was really when I started coding and, and had a prototype. Mm -hmm. September was when I launched. So it's like nine months from yeah, exactly. ideation. Now along that journey, I mean clearly you're being very thoughtful about the product. Did you ever think about, oh wow, you know, I need to find a co founder or was, hey, I have this deep passion to solve this problem, I'm gonna go do it. I think that entrepreneurship class at Stanford was very helpful for me because mm -hmm. there were stories shared among how if you choose the wrong co-founder, mm -hmm. you can just result in a company that isn't yours, a vision that isn't yours. And so when I looked around me after enough discussions with enough of my classmates, I hadn't met anyone who could share that empathy that I had from my undergrad days. And I understand that, you know, I went to undergrad in 1998. At that time, no one had laptops, so everybody was forced to study in one common place. Mm -hmm. So all the boys in my class, I'm pretty sure, thought, yeah, you know, I had enough of a support group. I didn't being one of very few women in computer science. So when I look out and, and talk to minorities today, they feel what I felt. Mm -hmm. um, over 10 years, that has changed, where now many people can understand that pain point because everyone has a laptop and studies by themselves. They can be connected. 
So kind of nine months in, kind of have this initial version. Then, then the, how do you progress? How does this turn into the Piazza today with, with 14 people? Yeah, well, uh, those nine months I kept trying to meet undergrads at Stanford, mm -hmm. hoping someone would buy into my vision and magically say, yep, I'll build it for you, I believe in it. That didn't happen. You know, for five months I was trying very hard to find undergrads at Stanford who would be excited and say, I'll put together the prototype. Because again, I had never done web development, so the idea of me having to build a first prototype was very scary. Mm -hmm. And by May, summer came around. On purpose, I just did not want to take up any other summer internship job. So while all my classmates were, you know, interviewing with McKinsey and Bain and whatever it was, I said, no, this is the idea that I'm passionate about. And I'm going to do whatever it takes this summer just to keep working on it. Mm. And so that June, I hadn't found anyone, I had wireframes, and I just picked up the book on Ruby on Rails and started building. And that was scary. Mm -hmm. That July, I still remember sitting in a lab at Stanford thinking, you know, I have to put a job posting up. I have to try to find someone else in some other way. I had the mm -hmm. first professor who said he was going to use Piazza that September. So I remember trying to browse Monster's website and a couple other job postings website, and I really couldn't figure out how to use it because it was so cluttered. <laughs> uh, Craigslist was the simplest for me to figure out how to put a job posting out, and it was the cheapest because I was a poor grad student. So I remember taking out my credit card. I didn't have much money at the time. I remember taking out my credit card, looking at the cost of $75 to put an ad on, on, on Craigslist job postings, and said, you know, this could be $75 down the drain, or it could be the best use of $75. And the next day I got a lot of applicants. And one of them is today our lead developer. Hmm. And he is the smartest engineer I've ever met. And he got it, he got my vision. He was one of those people who never needed help, mm -hmm. but he could tell that there are students who do. Mm -hmm. They get stuck, despite being bright, they just get stuck. Mm -hmm. And since then he and I have iterated like crazy and you know, he and I have shared most of the journey together. Mm -hmm. For the first two years of his time at Piazza, he was actually part time because Piazza hadn't raised money. Mm -hmm. And so he had a day job to pay for his bills. And this was like, this was really his baby in a way. The day job was really just a way to earn a living. Yeah. But you know, 6 a.m. meetings or 9 p.m. meetings or weekends, whatever it was, we just iterated. And that fall, so it was him and I together that launched Piazza. We got the help of uh, designers in the form of consultants, just kind of like a couple months here, mm -hmm. a couple months there. However, I could, you know, scramble, scrappy, yeah. very scrappy. Yeah. You know, the history of design help for Piazza has just been intense where yeah. May 2010 is the first time I found a designer who, again, till today is part-time because he's a student at Stanford. But all through, you know, it's like, well, what, what do I need to get to the next step? Mm -hmm. And if I cannot find that perfect full-time designer who's willing to leave wherever they are and come join a company that hasn't proven itself, it's like, fine, I'll make do with what I can. And so I called up a lot of design firms. The first, mm. you know, first designer that I actually got help from was situated in Denver. Mm. And I would draw my mocks on paper, take photos from my phone, send it over to them. You know, they would pretty it up and, and Im, you know, send, send back the implementation that my backend engineer mm -hmm. would then tie in. And, you know, I'd learned enough HTML, CSS to tweak what they were sending mm -hmm. back to me. That's a great, that's a great approach to, to kind of be scrappy and <laughs> to, to go leverage that. One of the things that just comes to my mind is um, knowing full well how lonely and difficult just starting a company can be. I mean, you had a long period of time where it was just you persevering. You had that conviction about... Like what? What can you share with this audience of yeah. things that like helped you through that? Because I think anyone who actually does it ex experiences that. I think hearing other entrepreneurs was very inspiring, mm -hmm. because I had heard that it's better to go through it alone or go through it with the right people than go through it with more people who might be the wrong people. And I learned a lot about my willpower through those. 12 months, you know, in 2009, when I mm -hmm. saw many of my classmates at business school founding companies with classmates, but all I could think of is there's no one who understands what I'm trying to solve, mm -hmm. and, you know, I want to wait until yeah, I find those people. That's really kind of grasp that passion around the problem. Yeah. yeah, and I'm very glad I did. Today, I'm very fortunate where we're 13 people on the team. Yeah. Many of them I recruited because they were on the Piazza platform, touched by you know mm. using it in their school, Princeton or UIUC, Stanford, uh, and, and you know they've joined a team understanding mm -hmm. what our mission is. 
because you went for a period of time where it was just you, kind of CEO, head engineer, everything, and now you've grown up to, to 13, and I'm sure you'll keep growing. How has it been, or what lessons, if you're looking back on that transition and that growth, what things would you have done differently, uh, potentially, as you let go? Because you had to let go of being the only developer and, and whatnot. I mean, what kind of the, what's some of the key lessons? The first lessons? time that I stopped coding was very difficult. Mm -hmm. I mean, I loved coding. Uh, but I knew that I had to do more things for the company. I had to go find that next professor who was mm -hmm. going to sign up. Mm -hmm. And I had to go raise money. I had to put PowerPoints together. I didn't know how to do any of this stuff. And um, I believe I stopped coding sometime in, in 2010. I had that designer from Stanford who started doing all the front end. I had that back end engineer who started doing all the back end. And all I had to do was find more professors to use our product to get feedback, to iterate. So I had a very key role, I still do today, mm. on defining the product. Mm -hmm. I just wasn't the one implementing it. I see. So for the next two years, I stayed very close with our designer and engineers, just three of us for quite a while, mm -hmm. uh, iterating based on user feedback. I would meet many, many users, see how they used our product, develop deep empathy. What is their workflow? Today, many people ask me, how is Piazza different from, say, Quora or any other site like Edmodo that's, that's Q&A? And I say, we understand the workflow of the student, and we understand the workflow of the instructor, and we optimize around their workflow. And that saves them 10 to 15 hours a week. Right? Professors save 10 to 15 hours a week because we've built in for their workflow. Hmm. Uh, now, as you made that transition, and you had to learn how to go fundraise and be selling. What did you find was helpful to, to go learn how to do these things? I mean, there's not a lot of manuals, we'll say. Well, I've, I've learned that it's going to be frustrating, and I've learned that I'm going to be stressed out and, and just feel terrible through the first times that I do any one new thing. Mm -hmm. So, for example, in January 2011, that was the first time we publicly launched Piazza, which meant mm -hmm. that anyone could go to piazza.com and create a class of their own. Up until then, from fall 2009 till December 2010, I would speak to a professor and create the class for them and then enroll them. Now, January 2011, 65 classes, 65 professors at Stanford created their classes when we launched it publicly. That told me something is right. People are liking the product and it's spreading by word of mouth on campus. Hmm. So my advisor suggested go drive to Berkeley. I did. And within a week, 40 classes at Berkeley signed up. Hmm. And they said, well, try to go to more campuses. So I had to hop on a flight to Princeton. I knew no one, and I just started knocking on doors, meeting professors, showing them the demo, saying, I just graduated from Stanford. I wanted to build this, so I built it. Professors at Stanford and Berkeley today are using it. Would you like to see a demo? Hmm. And they wouldn't turn me away. They'd say, OK, I have a few minutes. And many of them turned into today who are advocates. And they would tell more f professors, saying, you know, this product understands me, understands mm -hmm. me as a professor and my pain points and solves for it. Hmm. And I remember flying to MIT and knocking on doors. It's interesting. Charles Lyserson is one of the co-authors of one of my favorite algorithms books, Corman Lyserson, mm -hmm. and I didn't know who he was. And I remember knocking on his door and sitting next to him, and all I could tell is, oh, he's a very nice person, and he really understands what we've built. Many, many months later, <laughs> I connected. I was like, holy cow, I, sh I shot him an email. Yeah. No, that's, that's a great story. <laughs> um, one of, I mean, with, with hiring those folks, and again, I'm just thinking of like kind of you kind of keep delegating and push, you know, pushing off things to other folks. Um, what were kind of some of the lessons that you learned of just hiring, especially when you're just like it's kind of your yeah. child and yeah. you want other people to have that same passion? Yeah. And that's hard. That can be hard. I learned by making a lot of mistakes. Mm. I definitely went in with the assumption that if they seem bright and say they're bright and say they're excited and say they yeah. can do whatever I give them, you know, I thought that would hold. And I would find that not everyone can do anything and everything. And, you know, same for myself. The only reason I've been able to learn and pick up a lot of skills is because I'm just so committed and, you know, mm -hmm. I will learn from advisors, I will learn from people better than me on how to develop a skill if it will further the company. But I've had to iterate a lot on when I find bright people, what exactly is the right role mm -hmm. that brings out their strengths. And so, f you know, fitting for the right role and the right person has been something that, that has been an interesting mm -hmm. learning for me. Mm -hmm. Now, you kind of mentioned advisors a couple times. Um, talk to me a little bit like those, uh, that advisor group and, and what you've kind of seen work or not work. Yeah, you know, it, 
It comes back to a bit of my background that before business school, all I knew was to code. Mm -hmm. And so I've never been a great communicator. Mm -hmm. Advisors that I work the best with are those who can tease out all the details by asking a lot of the right questions. Mm -hmm. Because it's not natural to me to know exactly what to say and to say it in the first five sentences. And so uh, I found a few people, mostly the pattern I find is they're operators. Mm -hmm. So they understand that the first two sentences as I say have a lot of depth to them. Mm -hmm. And they'll ask about a lot of subtleties. Mm -hmm. And then that's when they wait to give me any suggestions or advice or direction, which is great for me. Mm -hmm. I don't feel under pressure that I am being judged too soon or you know, so on and so forth. I remember you know, now is the first time again that I feel like we have a very solid team that operates together well. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to one of my advisors particularly, and it's like, is, you know, is this natural that you lose some people along the way? You have to let some people go. And, you know, now I believe we have the right culture and we can interview for the right culture. And he said, yes, that's very normal for startups. And mm -hmm. it suddenly made me feel so, so human, mm -hmm. you know? Great. Well, thank you so much, Pooja, for coming, coming on stage here. And thank you, everyone, for watching. And we'll see you soon.